Okay, um, thanks very much. I have to start off by saying thank you uh, to Donald and to Christian for organising this. Also thanks to the Riot Games for like organising the food and the beer and the venue. Um, this is my first time speaking at INOG. Um, I've also never been to INOG either, so um, yeah, I'm going to try and skip through my slides pretty quickly and let you get to your social part of the night. Um, my name's Tom Shaw. I've been working for Riot Games since April. Um, previous to Riot Games, I was working in Demonware Activision, um, working on titles like Call of Duty, Skylanders. Um, I'm going to cover stuff like um, the history of Docker. I kind of want to give a, an idea of where Docker came from, like some of the uh, foundational work that was done by companies like IBM, uh, by Google, and then kind of build up to where Docker is currently and where they're kind of heading in the future. Um, I'm going to talk, um, I'm going to give examples of like ways that we've used Docker in production. Um, all these examples are from Demonware. None of these are taken from Riot, so there's no like secrets being shared. Um, so you feel free to like quote me on Twitter or whatever, it's grand. Um, and then we'll have a quick uh, pop quiz at the end, just to see if anybody's been listening. Okay, so I'm a systems engineer. Uh, my background is a bit of a, a mishmash. I'm kind of like a jack of all trades. I started off in quality, testing Java releases at Sun. Um, I went into configuration management. I did a bit of tools development. I was a build engineer for five years, and now I work on like backend systems for Rack Games. I'm also a Docker captain. Sorry, one sec. better okay cool um yeah at the start i was thanking riot i have to thank dom as well he kind of set all this up and got all the slides lined up so thanks very much dom okay so yeah uh, my career is kind of like jumping from different roles so i kind of have um i've had access to working with like net engineer or net edge folks uh with developers with qa um right through into like configuration management um, before talking about Docker, like it's worth mentioning that containers themselves are actually, um, they've been around in some sort of form since around the late 70s. Um, not so much isolation of processes, but isolation or um, moving the, the root directory into a different locations so you can run like build commands, so you're not actually accessing the host itself. So it's not really new technology. A lot of folks hear of Docker and they think, well, it's just like this new hype, it's Kool-Aid, um, people are jumping on the bandwagon. But a lot of the under underlying technologies have been around for years. Um, all this information came from a, a blog post by Aqua Security. Aqua Security, um, if you're in the container space at all, Aqua Security provide like solutions for like monitoring uh, your containers in production. So if you want any more information on um, this timeline, it's all in their blog post. Um, so yeah, where did Docker start? Uh, Docker started in 2013. Um, for the first year or two, Docker was really focused around the developer experience. They just wanted to get Docker out there, get it into the developers' hands, uh, get the developers building images and deploying containers. Um, Docker really um, valued like good design over like lots of features. So they want that user experience to be really, really slick. So in 2014, uh, they announced products like Docker Machine, Docker Swarm, uh, Compose. Um, this was basically to allow developers to move quickly, get their containers into, into the cloud, into AWS, into Azure and just basically try to um, increase adoption of containers. Uh, 2015, they started to look more at the like enterprise side of things. They started to build the foundations of what is currently the enterprise edition. Uh, 2016, they wanted to focus more on the operator side of um, things. Um, so giving operators a way to deploy Docker across multiple clouds with like a single click. Um, one thing Docker was very good at initially was just simplifying like quite complex processes down into like uh, single line commands or a one click process. Um, so in 2016, you could deploy Docker into AWS or Azure with just one click. And that was very popular amongst operators who were previously deploying using like Bash or Ansible or uh, Puppet, maybe. Uh, 2017, uh, multi stage builds got released. Um, one of the problems with Docker was that developers were just putting like so much stuff in the containers. They're kind of treating containers like VMs. Um, we had one example in Demonware where a developer created a, a container, it was like 12 gigs. He basically just took a tar bundle stuck in a container image, and we're trying to push this around our infrastructure. Um, if you treat containers like VMs, you're really not going to get much of a benefit from them. Um, Kubernetes integration was something that Docker kind of had to do. Um, they were trying to compete against Kubernetes, up against Google. Uh, that didn't end well. 
so, <laughs> so they announced um, Kubernetes integration into Enterprise Edition last year. And then this year, they're focusing more on traditional applications, uh, Windows containers, and also trying to improve the build process. Uh, the way you build Docker images hasn't really changed in the first four years. Um, now they've introduced build kits. It's much more efficient. Um, yeah, if you haven't tried build kit, it's really awesome. You should give it a go. Uh, so Docker adoption. Every year, Datadog release a report um, of like real world adoption of Docker. And the numbers are kind of staggering from the first couple of years of Docker usage right up until recently. Uh, the growth has just been exponential. Um, they also have some really good stats around the lifetime of containers. Whenever folks started using containers back in 2014, 2015, they were running containers like VMs. They were starting them up and just leaving them running for days or months. Um, but then in 2017, 2018 report, they noticed that people were running a lot more containers on single hosts, but the lifespan of containers was down to minutes. So people are kind of adapting to containers and adapting their workflows to, to suit in with um, how containers operate. Um, I highly recommend the Datadog um, website if you're interested in numbers. It's very interesting. Okay, so this is the journey to production. Um, whenever we introduced Docker initially in Demoware, it was to solve a real world problem. Uh, we were a build engineering team. We had a bunch of uh, build agents and we had multiple teams to support. So team A would come to us and say, we need to build this package. We need these versions of Python libraries installed. We would install them, they'd build their package. And then Team B would come along and say, well, actually, you know, we need a different version of packages, so we'd have to, we're just constantly jumping between dependencies on the build agents. It wasn't ideal. So Docker just solved this problem overnight. Um, we didn't even ask for permission at this point. We just, we heard about Docker, it solved the problem, and we just moved builds into containers. So we went from what looked like this into an environment where developers had complete power to control what versions of dependencies were installed, which BS images were used, uh, they controlled the, the full workflow, basically, um, and that was taken away from the build engine team. The build engine team at that point was two people. Uh, we're a single point of failure. Uh, this gave developers the control to move fast um, without our help. Uh, for anybody who's been trying to build a package without um, dependencies, like trying to track down dependencies can be a real nightmare, um, especially in the case of Demonware, we're running services for maybe 10 years. Trying to rebuild a package from 10 years ago, um, yeah, that's very tricky. You'll find yourself looking on the dark web for dependencies. You'll be on BitTorrent. Um, seriously, this is, <laughs> uh, it, it does get very tricky after a certain amount of time. Uh, so Docker really just came along. We installed it on all, on all the build agents. And we showed developers how to use it. It was just a text file, very straightforward. And the teams that picked up Docker fast just loved it. Like They had complete control over the workflow now. And dependency hell just went away pretty much overnight. Okay, so next up was testing. Um, we saw that this solved the, the build problem. Uh, how could we use Docker to, to solve, like, um, like get our tests to run faster? Uh, so we tried putting single tests in the containers. That worked quite nicely. And we tried putting large chunks of tests in the containers. That also worked really nicely. Um, the nice thing about using containers for your test environment is that everything is defined in code. Uh, previously, we'd run tests inside VMs, or developers would run them on their uh, laptop that they installed five years ago or on a VM. Um, we had so many black boxes in Demonware that trying to get repeatable builds and repeatable tests was actually very difficult. So we moved the whole test environment in the container. Um, this code was pushed in the GitHub and every team got to see your test environment. Okay, so we got to share this around the full organization. There's no more black boxes. Like if you wanted a, to share your environment with another team, you give them a link to your Docker file and they can start using your environment straight away. And the environments themselves are very fast to recreate. Um, yeah, and we didn't actually buy any new hardware at this point. Like, we were just kind of getting used to Docker. So we just used our existing hardware, and we crammed as many containers on as possible before the box would fall over. Um, Rory, who was in the same build hinge team sitting over there, um, this wasn't a very scientific approach. We basically just like tried to cram as many containers on to try and keep the box stable, and that was our, our limit. Um, so on our existing hardware, instead of running one process or one test, um, we could run like 25 containers with multiple sets of tests. And this brought uh, test times down from like one hour down to like, I think one case down to 12 minutes. So developers were getting this quicker feedback cycle. And um, it also meant they were getting better utilization from our hardware. We were just really hammering it for every single build. Uh, developers also like this setup because the environments they use locally are identical to the environments that they use in the CI pipeline. So all these little differences that used to be there um, just went away. So the quality of the builds in Jenkins and Bamboo was much higher because developers were catching issues within the first few minutes locally, 
and fixing it, and then before it got into CI, um, the bug was gone. So developers really like this approach. Um, yeah, so it kind of got a bit out of hand. It's uh, 2015, 2016 is a bit blurry. Um, we got our build agents, our test environments into containers, and then we just started looking at other stuff in, in the organization that put it in containers. Um, some of our tooling, I'll cover this a bit later on, some of the tooling that we ran on our hosts um, was containerized. And this allowed other teams to share the same tooling. So we could build a, a, tool, a tool like Smokeping to run on our build agents. And other teams, like maybe NetEng, might want to use the same tool and they could run it as well. Uh, we put our CI servers into containers. Jenkins was the first one to go in. Uh, we crammed in Bamboo. It didn't really work very well, but it's possible. And then some of our internal services as well. Um, we want the, the entire CI pipeline to be containerized. Um, we went from having these black boxes, um, black box environments that were set up manually over time. Uh, we wanted to be able to tear down the full infrastructure and build it anywhere. I'll give an example of why this was really important in 2016. Um, we wanted to be able to just lift and shift our entire build infrastructure from our DC into AWS. And we pretty much did it in one afternoon. We had everything defined in code. We had Docker, the same version of Docker installed in AWS, and we just spun it up. So it was just a lift and shift. And without containers, we just couldn't have done that. Uh, we also tried putting more containers inside containers. Uh, it's a bit gimmicky, but it, it can be done. Um, if you want to run like a Jenkins and build agent inside a single container, it, it's definitely possible. Okay, so uh, networking use cases. Uh, one thing we did notice is that the NetEng team didn't adopt Docker initially, but they started to look at what the, the DevOps teams were doing and started to look at their CI process. Uh, developers were using Docker for running static analysis locally. Um, so NetEng team started to take on some of the same tooling. Um, so, for example, developers would have Ansible installed in a container, and they'd run their static analysis and pre-commit. And NetEng were doing the same thing. They were testing their configuration locally inside a container before they were pushing in the source code and then running it through CI. So that's quite an interesting sort of um, approach where NetEng were looking at what DevOps are doing and then adopting some of the same practices. Um, they also used it for setting up these mini clusters locally and used that to like play about with different routers. I'll kind of cover the VRNet lab in the next slide. Um, yeah, also for like evaluating tooling. Uh, 10 years ago, if you wanted to evaluate a piece of tooling, you could spend days or weeks or even just like a full weekend trying to get stuff installed. Uh, with Docker, it's literally just a one-liner. So they use it to like containerize thousand eyes, a bunch of other tooling that they could just share around the organization. Uh, it was just a one-liner to run. Everybody got access to the same tooling. It really democratized um, the tool set. There was no specialist knowledge required to run this. As long as you had Docker installed, you could run the same tooling that NetEng are using or the same tooling that the developers are using. And then I mentioned smoke ping. Um, I'm not a networking person, but whenever I saw smoke ping, I thought it was awesome. Apparently, it's like 15 years old or 10 year old maybe. Um, we used this in all our build and test environments. <clears throat> we had some issues with our network being flaky, so we used smoke ping to basically correlate uh, network flaps with build failures. So whenever a developer would come to us and say Bamboo's broken or your build agents are broken, uh, we could look at the, the smoke ping graphs and see if there's any sort of network flaps that cause like dependencies to stop downloading or just like um, cause the build to fail. Okay, so VR NetLab. Um, there's a guy called Hugo Stabert, worked in Demonware, and um, very smart guy. Um, he's very good at explaining stuff in simple terms. Um, he said, I'm not a networking person, so Hugo, Hugo was like a, a vital resource. Uh, but he recommended VR NetLab. So the code is on GitHub. You can run a bunch of these um, routers locally. You can just spin them up in containers. You can poke them, you can destroy them. Um, he used this to set up lots of little mini clusters that he ran tests against. So it's quite a nice approach. Uh, it's very clean as well. Everything's containerized. If you don't want to run it, you just tear it down. Uh, the overlay network's really popular in Docker as well. Uh, there's a lot of tooling um, available from the networking perspective. Like some of these can be installed as plugins. It's a one-liner install in your Docker um, engine. Or they'll run, a, <laughs> run a sidecars on your host at the same time. Uh, lots of options out there. Um, it's kind of just, because these are so easy to install and evaluate, you can pretty much get through these in a, a few days, just like install, tests. If you don't like it, move on. Whereas like years ago, it was quite a heavy investment to actually go through this type of tooling and evaluate it properly. OK, so next up was production. Um, we kind of felt that we were ready at this point um, to <laughs> run containers in production. Um, we had three years' experience. Um, our NetEng folks had used Docker. Our developers were using Docker. Our ops folks knew about Docker, so we were obviously ready to run in production. And we did to um, a certain extent. We launched a title in 2016, Skylanders Imaginators, if you've ever played it. The back end's running in Docker containers. 
Um, the changes we made were basically around moving away from these like snowflake black box environments into pipelines defined in code. And um, a good example of this is we had our entire CI pipeline to deploy a production service defined in code. And we got some of our, our project managers who weren't technical at all uh, to sit down and deploy changes in the production. And I gave one of our junior PMs, um, sat down, no experience, and pushed code into production. Um, and it went through a containerized pipeline. And um, that was it. Like Previously, that would have taken like pretty much hours and days to push out changes. And we got that down to minutes from a, a user who had no experience of the technology. So that's quite a, a nice sort of change. Um, we also wanted to keep the developer workflow really simple. Like the Docker CLI is really clean. The API is really clean. Um, developers knew how to use, compose, and machine. Um, so we just wanted to keep the, the full workflow as simple as possible. Uh, we shipped the title. Um, it was successful on Christmas Day. Typically at Demonware, we'd have somebody keeping an eye on graphs, making sure they don't need to spin up more resources. Uh, in this case, I think it's the first time at Demonware that um, yeah, we didn't have to do that. We used Mesos Marathon for the container orchestration, and we were using auto scaling. So on Christmas Day, whenever the peak did happen, um, there's no way Demon were actually working that day. So it's quite a nice sort of human touch of how like, containers helped us improve how we deploy to production. OK, so we learned a lot of lessons. Whenever you're building a containerized pipeline, if you leave any gaps for like human interaction, um, that's where it's going to break. If you've got 97% automated pipeline and you leave 3% for a developer to go in and poke the, the um, hosts, that's where it's going to break. So yeah, do not uh, hand bomb changes in the production. Um, try and lock down your pipeline as much as possible. If you can make your infrastructure immutable and just destroy it and rebuild every time, that's the ideal situation. Um, having a bunch of developers who have SSH access in the production, uh, no matter how experienced they are, like mistakes happen. If you get paged at 4 o'clock in the morning, Oh, this hasn't happened to me. <laughs> if you log in this, the wrong server and reboot it, um, yeah, that's not great. If you want to try and drive everything through some sort of UI, uh, have checks in place, and just try and lock down like production as much as possible. OK, so remove opportunities for human error. Uh, invest in good logging monitoring. Uh, because containers are moving around constantly, it's much harder to track um, issues whenever they do occur. Uh, so tools like Datadog are just invaluable. You might be paying a subscription. It might be expensive, but whenever shit breaks down, <laughs> like the other dog can really point you to the problem very quickly. So that's highly recommended. Um, try and have your, your entire infrastructure defined in code. If, if you have any black boxes at all in your pipeline, um, that's, the, that's the real sort of risk. Okay? If you're pushing code to production and you have one service that's been deployed by some engineer five years ago and you've got no idea how it was deployed, that's the area that you need to really focus on. Get that service defined in code, get it containerized, uh, get it building repeatedly, and then add that back into your pipeline. So these black box environments and snowflake environments, you have to get, get rid of those completely. Uh, building with portability in mind, <clears throat> we didn't want to lock ourselves into AWS. Uh, so we tried to build the tooling in a way that we could lift and shift our infrastructure around different clouds. Um, that's quite tricky to do, actually. Um, we got tied into AWS a little bit with some of their API calls. Um, but whenever you're building these sorts of like pipelines, try and just um, try and think about where you're going to be in five years' time or even two years' time. Having the ability to move infrastructure around the cloud is actually really powerful. Like If you're trying to cut costs, um, you can maybe jump into the Google Cloud one year and then maybe jump into the Azure the next year. Uh, so try and keep portability as much as possible. Uh, try and create your pipeline so it's just really, really fast. Uh, you don't really want to roll back uh, a, a problem reduction. If you can deploy a new fix within two minutes, that could be good enough. Um, trying to get it through the testing process in two minutes is probably the biggest challenge. Um, our end end tests, our unit tests, our system tests, um, they were really, really slow. And that was the part of the, the pipeline that we really struggled with. <coughs> OK, so next up was process and culture. Um, I, I introduced Docker back in 2013 at Demonware. Uh, the technology itself isn't that complex. Uh, the problem is trying to get people to buy in to Docker. Um, I heard stuff like, um, we can't use Docker, it's not secure. Um, stop drinking a Docker Kool-Aid. People call me Docker Tom. <laughs> um, yeah, so trying to get buy-in early is really critical, especially for management. It's like, if you can prove that this works with numbers, the managers are more likely to buy-in. Um, one of the turning points was never we moved uh, tests in the containers, and we showed management, like, we've cut test time from 60 minutes down to 12 minutes, and then it clicked, like, yeah, containers, we should be using these. So if you have, like, some sort of hard uh, numbers to give management, um, you can probably win them over. 
Okay, um, it's really important to define your processes as well. Uh, it really doesn't matter what tooling you use. Um, if your processes just suck really badly, then <laughs> the tooling doesn't matter. You could spend millions buying the right tooling, um, but like if your best practices aren't there and your process is flawed in some way, then you're not going to get the full benefit. So really focus on the process. Uh, get it refined to the point where everybody buys into the process, they understand the process, it's repeatable, um, it's using best practices, and then take it from there. Then decide what tools you're going to choose. Uh, very often organizations hear about a new tool, um, something like Kubernetes, and they're like, yep, yeah, it's good enough for Google, it's good enough for us. Um, a lot of times it's not really necessary. Just focus on your own uh, problem areas and your processes, and then decide which tools you're going to use. Um, Docker encourages best practices, but it doesn't force you to use best practices. Um, you'll get all sorts of crazy use cases. Uh, the best way to avoid this is to provide uh, training early on. Get all your developers in one room, get all your users in one room, and give them training. If you kind of filter it throughout your organization over a period of a few years, you have some developers that are very experienced, you have other developers who just won't touch Docker because it's, it's evil, and uh, you have that wide range of experience levels. Um, I'd recommend if you're trying to adopt Docker, get everybody in the one room, spend two days, uh, and just get it knocked out really early, get everybody on the same page. Uh, it's quite a famous quote from this year, actually. Um, yeah, if your culture really sucks, like if, if you work in a toxic environment, um, it was mentioned earlier on about diversity and inclusion. Um, yeah, if your culture is broken, like if you're working in an environment where people aren't included in decision making, people don't feel welcome, they don't have a voice, then it really doesn't matter what type of container you use, like it's not going to solve your problems. So work on fixing your culture first. So the next five years, what's going to happen? Uh, I've got no idea. <laughs> so um, I'm going to skip through these really quickly because I'm picking them out of time. Okay, Docker's going to keep evolving the platform. Um, Docker's been around for five years. They need to start making money really fast. They're going to start selling Enterprise Edition. It's becoming really popular, especially in like financial in, uh, institutes. Uh, anywhere it's running like really old uh, Windows containers, that's Docker's sort of new playground. Uh, Docker's also open source. Like the entire core of Docker is in like separate repos. So if you want to cont contribute to Container D or Build Kit or Swarm Kit, um, just join the community. It's very active. Um, people are very helpful. If you have any questions about the community, just come up and ask myself at the end. I'll help you out, hopefully. Um, embedded devices, Internet of Things. Um, something that has happened in the past couple of years is um, as we move more applications into containers, uh, the operating system itself and the host becomes a real sort of like target for like hackers. There's quite a, a large footprint there. Um, so they're designing uh, containerized operating systems that are specialized just for running containers. They're very lightweight, smaller uh, attack footprints, and you can install them in bare metal. Uh, so one example is Resin OS. Um, along with like security, uh, stability of the Docker engine and the core um, of Docker is really important. Um, we're moving away from just running websites and applications in Docker uh, towards like life critical systems. Um, there's a white paper written quite recently about using containers to control self-driving cars. Uh, if your website goes down and you lose a few customers, it's not great. If you're driving a car down a motorway and you have to restart the, the Docker engine because it's controlling braking, that's pretty serious. So the, the real focus is on like uh, stability um, and moving like containerized systems into like life critical um, systems. Uh, data scientists also love Docker. Um, we had a, a talk at the Docker meetup at the start of the year. It's one of our most popular talks. Uh, the problem that data scientists have is there's so many different types of tooling, all of different quality. Uh, Docker kind of solves that problem where you can build your, uh, your data sets, your training data in the container, you can put the tooling in there, and then you can share it around the whole organization so everybody gets access to it. Uh, Docker's also democratized this quite a lot. You can download the machine box, you can do text-based analysis, image analysis, and um, yeah, it's so simple that like, a five-year-old could just like, run a container and be using this really powerful tooling outside of it. Are using Docker. So five years later, Docker's still delivering. I'm obviously very biased, um, but Docker are still putting um, features back in the open source community. Uh, stuff like BuildKit that was built initially internally um, is being shared with the community. So I think Docker is still delivering. I just think it's going to change. Um, the ecosystem's changing so fast that they might be delivering in a different area. They might move more towards Windows containers. Um, maybe the focus on the open source community might, might shift a bit. And then five things I wish I'd known five years ago. Um, image registry is really important. Um, we had a developer in DMware logged in to free up some space, deleted every single image we had. Um, 
get a good image registry, lock it down, it becomes critical. You want to share your containers around your organization. Customer buy-in, especially for management, really early is, is important. Um, be prepared for growth. Uh, developers won't go from one container to two containers. They'll go from one container to 100. Uh, Docker becomes so simple to use that you start off like running <coughs> a T2 micro on AWS, and all of a sudden, you're just borrowing money to feed your obsession with like running containers. It just grows really, really, uh, really fast. Uh, labeling's important as well. Without labeling, your containers can become black boxes. You've got no idea who built them. You don't know where they came from. Make sure your images are labeled. And then sidecars are really useful as well. Uh, so you run sidecars and hosts to provide higher level services like uh, metrics gathering, logging, and then you just take all that away from the developer. They don't have, you don't have to think about that. Pop quiz, true or false? Docker democratized container technology. Any guesses? That's obviously true. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, I don't have any prizes for these, by the way. Um, <laughs> containers can help you save money. Uh, they reduce the hardware costs. You can cram lots of containers on the single boxes. Get better bang for your buck. True or false? True. Has to be true, otherwise, yeah, we wouldn't be using it. And then containers are silver bullet. They're going to solve all your problems. If you believe this statement, then come and see me at the end. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's impossible. I think that's it. The community needs you. If you want to join the Docker Dublin meetup group, if you want to talk more about containers, just grab me at the end. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. Um, a side project is DNI Manifesto. If anybody's interested, grab me at the end. I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Any questions? Uh, Lorcan, do you see network uh, network hardware running containers in the in the near future, or do they at all? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think there are probably some cases where containers are already being used, like in embedded like network devices. I wouldn't have any like um, yeah, I wouldn't have any sort of examples of that. Best person to talk to is Hugo, Hugo Stabbert on Twitter. Like he loves all this stuff. Like he spends his weekends like playing around with like networking and containers. Uh, for anybody in the audience, like he's just a really friendly guy, uh, very sort of approachable. Um, and he's very up to date as well. He's involved in the Docker community, so he kind of knows what's going on there. So if you have any questions around that, like Hugo would be a good guy to ping. I can maybe help a bit with this. It's You can run containers on a few platforms. So not necessarily run routers inside of containers, but the other way around. So you can, some vendors allow containers to run on their platform. They might not be Docker containers. There might be, I think, just uh, LXC containers or something. But you can run your scripts or whatever in a, in a container on that platform. And also, like you mentioned, Tom mentioned VR NetLab. That, that's a good way of running for testing, running virtual routers inside of Docker containers and spinning that up quickly. So I think that uh, that's pretty much the state today, or part of it, anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sorry, just one question from a do Docker cynic, just because I heard something. So, uh, is it possible to run Docker's, you know, where the the network stack is unmolested by the host OS, so it's just like bridged, or you know, I heard that there's a lot of NATs on top of NATs on top of NATs, and that's horror stories about like that, which scared the crap out of me as a network engineer. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that's a good question. Um, one of the, the shifts in the community at the moment is people are moving away from the, the full Docker binary, um, which has like a lot of like, it does a lot of network manipulation and uh, just stuff that developers don't want happening. And they're actually moving more towards just running container D. So container D doesn't like modify the network, it allows you to run containers on the host. It's a lot more cut down version of containers. Um, if you want to take it back even further, you can just run run C and start containers that way. So it's not modifying the network, you get to control that yourself. Um, so some projects are actually, um, like in Kubernetes, I think they don't use the Docker binary as such, they just use Containerd. So it might be a good approach if you want to avoid Docker playing with your network, then Containerd is uh, a good project to look at. No worries. No worries. Okay. All right, so maybe we just give it up for Tom one more time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Real quick.